Um, all right. The little hiccup there was that I was looking for a Bible reading and I thought he was doing it. So I was a little bit confused. Let me pull this up. You can turn here as well. We're going to Exodus 12. If you've got a phone or a iPad or a real Bible, extra points for real Bibles, I still think. On Friday nights, we give out rewards. We give, if, if kids come on a Friday night and they've got their Bible, a notebook and a pen so they can take some notes about what we're talking about, we reward that. We throw chocolate at them. <coughs> and um, some kids hand, I've oh, got my phone. I said, no. <laughs> I want a real Bible, real paper. Thank you. All right, Exodus chapter 12. That's, that's, there you go. Wonderful. That, While the Israelites were still in the land of Egypt, the Lord gave the following instructions to Moses and Aaron. From now on, this month will be the first month of the year for you. Announce to the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each family must choose a lamb or a young goat for a sacrifice. One animal for each household. If a family is too small to eat a whole animal, let them share with another family in the neighborhood. I always think that's a lovely instruction. It's not overwhelming for, an, for a smaller family, for the whole lamb. Just share it around. My family couldn't eat a whole lamb. Maybe yours could. <coughs> the animal you select must be a one-year-old male, either a sheep or a goat with no defects. Take special care of this chosen animal until the evening of the 14th day of this first month. Then the whole assembly of the community of Israel must slaughter their lamb or young goat at twilight. They are to take some of the blood and smear it on the sides and top of the door frames of the house where they eat the animal. That same night, they must roast the meat over a fire and eat it along with bitter salad greens and bread made without yeast. Do not eat any of the meat raw or boiled in water. The whole animal, including the head, legs and internal organs, must be roasted over a fire. Do not leave any trace, do not leave any of it until the morning. Burn whatever is not eaten before morning. These are the instructions. These are your instructions for eating this meal. Be fully dressed, wear your sandals and carry your walking stick in your hand. Eat the meal with urgency for this is the Lord's Passover. On the night I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn son and firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt for I am the Lord. Just remember that phrase, execute judgment on all the gods of Egypt. For I am the Lord. But the blood on your doorposts will serve as a sign marking the houses where you are staying. When I see the blood, I will pass over you. This plague of death will not touch you when I strike the land of Egypt. And then jumping down to 21. <coughs> then Moses called all the elders of Israel together and said to them, Go pick out a lamb or a young goat for each of your families and slaughter the Passover animal. Drain the blood in a basin, then take a bundle of hyssop branches and dip it into the blood. Brush the hyssop across the top and sides of the door frames of your houses, and no one may go out through the door until morning, for the Lord will pass through the land to strike down the Egyptians, for when he sees the blood on the top and sides of the door frame, the Lord will pass over your home. He will not permit his death angel to enter your house and strike you down. <coughs> How forgetful are you? As, as a, like I'm not, I'm old, I make the joke that I'm old, I'm in, I'm in youth ministry, and when I talk to teenagers, I say I'm old. Um, I know it's not that old, and I'm younger than some and older than others. But when I was younger, I felt like my mind was sharp, super sharp. I remembered everything. It's been the pattern of my life for, for a while. I don't actually have a social calendar. Like I just retain a couple of weeks in advance and then my, um, my well-organized wife... Uh, <laughs> has a calendar and then tells me what's coming up over the next couple of weeks and I keep those things fairly well locked in. But that's starting to slip. <laughs> things are just starting to... And it's part of me going, 
Ah, <laughs> I am getting old. Um, but there's all kinds of reasons why we don't remember things, right? Sometimes it just simply isn't important enough, right? So when a child brings home a birthday invitation from one of their friends who you don't even know and couldn't point to, that's not important enough for your brain, so that piece of paper goes on the fridge to remind you, right? So we've deemed that not important enough to store away, but important enough to be visible. Other times, we forget things because it's a skill that we've used, say, once, or something we've read once, and then we never use it again. Like if you're solving a tech problem, right? You Google, you work through the steps, and then you promptly forget everything you've just done because the tech problem is resolved, and then when it crops up again, you have to do the same thing again. As a hint, if you're dealing with the same tech problems over and over again, perhaps a better machine is what's in order. And sometimes we just forget because we forget. You could call it the corruption of sin on the human body. That might be a bit extreme, but it could be that. But we just forget stuff. And you know what? God knows. That's why there's wisdom in the instructions around the biblical festivals. Celebrate these every year. Here's exactly how you do it. Don't forget. Do it again and again. Because each festival is a reminder. It serves as a reminder. And for us who are living on this side of Jesus, it points to Jesus, either his fulfillment when he was here or what he's going to come and do. And so every year as a community, when we are celebrating these festivals, we are remembering what God has done. We are reminding ourselves what he's like. Because we forget. When I read the Old Testament sometimes, I, come, I, I feel myself having these incredulous thoughts. Like, how could Israel turn their backs on God? They've just gone through, say, the whole Exodus story. And they're out, and they're grumbling and complaining. And then they get saved again, and things are okay for a while. And then they start to complain again. One of the fun verses that I like from the Bible, is, it's in Numbers. And God is like so fed up with, they're like, oh, we don't want manna anymore. We want meat, 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 right? And God's like, you want meat? Fine. You'll have so much that's coming out of your nose, it's coming out of your, like he, it's, it's written in there like that. Like you just, I'm, I'm going to flood you. You're done, right? But they're complaining against the character of God because they've, it's like they've forgotten. And I can't imagine living like that and constantly forgetting what God has done. And yet they do. And at the same time that I have these incredulous thoughts, I find myself turning that magnifying glass on my own heart and going, but don't, don't you do the same thing? Maybe not to the same degree, but like, Maybe do a little bit of self-reflection here. How, where on your list of problem solving does God fall? Maybe he's the first thing you turn to. Fantastic. Maybe you start with yourself. I can fix this. Maybe you start making calls. That organization, that company can fix this. I mean, if it's a plumbing issue, that's fine. But do you know what I'm saying? Where does God fall in that list? Because it, it should be right there. And yet, I find even in myself, it just slips. And sometimes, sometimes when I'm feeling a weight on myself, like an oppression, it can take a full week before I go, hey, maybe I should pray about this, actually. <laughs> because I've just thought, if I have a nap, it'll be okay. If I just eat something more, it'll be okay. And so, we forget. And this is what the festivals do. They remind us. There's three of them there, three of them there, and one in the middle. And so, there's really no excuses to be reminded about the goodness of God. And we need it. I need it. 
So, we're going to look at Passover. And please, I'm not beating anybody else up, just beating myself up here, that's fine. Um, we're going to look at Passover, but I want to draw your attention to something. I heard it many years ago, and I went, you know what, that sounds really cool. And I thought, before I say it on stage, I need to substantiate this. So I did. The Passover story is incredibly important to our understanding of God. Now, have you ever heard of a thing called the frequency illusion? The frequency illusion is the reality where you suddenly become aware of something and begin to see it everywhere. We all know this, right? If you're buying a car and you're thinking, oh, I need, I need a sedan, you'll start to notice that one and that one, or a station wagon, that one and that one, or in the case of my son, he's like, Tesla's everywhere! <laughs> there's one there, he's, he's actually really good at spotting them. There's one, there's one, there's one. There's a lot out there now. I had this experience with buying a car, but it can be with anything. I was trying to buy a car and it was, I was doing research. I like to do research. I like to work out I'm going to get the best deal, the, the longest life out of it, all those types of things. And it, for those who know me, I am a best deal kind of guy. I've got all the coupons. I'm on all the birthday lists to get all the free stuff. I am that dude. If you want help, I can help you. Um, and so I'm doing my research and I finally go, one of, the, one of the deal breakers for me was it needed to fit my guitar in the boot. I was sick of putting it across the back seat of the car that I had, because I can't go to the shops and leave a guitar in the car, but I can if it's in the boot, nobody can see it. So I was like, my guitar's got to go in the boot. And I, I came to the place of going, I think a, a Hyundai i30 might be good. Now, after I sort of came to that conclusion, it's not what I got, but as I came to that conclusion, I began to see them in more and more places. They're out there, there's plenty of them out there because they're a very popular car, they're economical, they don't cost very much, they don't cost much to run. They're everywhere. But suddenly I can see them. There's one, there's one, there's one. Wow, they're all over the place, look at that. This is the frequency illusion. Once your attention has been drawn to a thing, you see it and perceive it as more frequent than it actually is. Its frequency hasn't changed, your awareness of it has. Now, here's where it applies to the Bible and Passover. The Passover is fundamental to the identity of God and Israel. So much so, that throughout the Old Testament, you get this type of phrase, who brought you out of Egypt. That's 31 examples right there on the screen, spread throughout the Old Testament. There are plenty more, but these are the ones that were most explicit because I figured if someone's going to screenshot this and test me on it, I want to be able to go, they're exactly what I said they were. But there are plenty of... <laughs> my sister-in-law is doing it. Um, <laughs> there are plenty of other examples that say sort of the same thing. But these are the ones that are really explicit. And it's examples of where God is saying, I am the one who brought you out of Egypt. Or it's examples of God's people saying to God, you're the one who brought us out of Egypt. They're tending to go, so fix the problem. That's the next part of the sentence. But it is so foundational to their identity and the relationship that they have. And it's actually one of the it's one of the few descriptors that God assigns to himself in the Bible. Lots of other ones are people saying, God, this is what you're like. Like that song we sing, Jehovah, Jehovah Nisi, the Lord my banner, Jehovah Rapha, the Lord my healer. All of these tend to be more people going, oh, God's healed me, this is great, you are God the healer. This is one that God gave to himself. He said, I'm the one who brought you out of Egypt. So I think this one's important. They're all important, but you know what I'm saying. So the question for us becomes, if the phrase is used so frequently, what do we learn about God and God's people? tells us that the Passover experience, the Exodus story, that's going to be sort of an interchangeable phrase, just so we get that out the way. Passover, Exodus, I mean the same thing. Um, it's a moment in history that becomes the foundation upon which God and His people appeal to one another. 
and it all hinges on the Passover experience. And I think it should be an important understanding for us as well. Paul says that we have been grafted in. So there are elements, and this is who God is. So we need to have this understanding of who God is. Now, the Exodus story is a cosmic confrontation. It's a confrontation between Yahweh and the gods of Egypt played out through the lower class Hebrew slaves and the ruling class Egyptians. Something that I find interesting here is that the Egyptians, they know where their allegiance lies. It's to the gods of Egypt. The Hebrews, they're not sure. They've been slaves for hundreds of years, and during this time, it seems like God, the God of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph, I'm just throwing him in there too, um, he's been silent. He's been distant. We don't have records of him speaking until this moment with Moses. And suddenly Moses is returning from the wilderness. He's been alive for 80 years and he walks up to the Hebrew slaves in their slavery, up to their eyeballs in mud and muck and the, the oppression. And he says, the I am is going to deliver you. I, I totally understand skepticism in that moment. Regardless, Yahweh is committed to bringing his people out of slavery. So through Exodus 7 through 10, you get this repeated confrontation where Moses will speak to Pharaoh, says, Yahweh says, let my people go. Pharaoh hardens his heart and says, no. This then causes the judgment to be visited upon the people, upon the land of Egypt, except in Goshen. Remember that from last week? We talked about that. Pharaoh then relents. Sometimes he puts conditions upon it. Uh... You can do it here. You can do it here. That's okay. You can do it here. No, nope, we're not going to do that. Okay, just, just the men, the women and the children stay here. No, nope, that's not going to work. Okay, you've got to leave your animals though. You can go, but you've got to leave that. There's conditions that he puts upon it that still keep the chain on them. That's the point. But once the plague lifts, he hardens his heart again and refuses to let them go. Or he just simply ignores them. There's a couple of the plagues in there where he just sort of looks out on the land and goes, eh. So there are 10 plagues in total, and this pattern is seen through the first nine. And each plague has a direct connection to one or more of the Egyptian gods. Do you know this? Maybe you do. Here's the list. I'm not going to read it all to you, but uh, look, you've got Tovim, Talk about the Nile becoming blood. You've got Happy, God of the annual flooding of the Nile, Lord of fish. You've got Osiris, and the Nile was his bloodstream. You sort of think he'd be happy about the blood one, but maybe not. Frogs, Hecht, the Egyptian goddess with the head of a frog. Gnats or lice. Geb was the god over the dust of the earth because Moses was instructed to pick up the dust and throw it, and it became the lice and the flies. Sorry, the, the gnats and the lice. Flies, Kepri. I don't know how to pronounce these. I'm just... Being fanatical, had, had the, the head of a beetle or a fly. Sick livestock, Hathor was the goddess of fertility, often depicted with the head of or horns of a bull. Boils, Isis, goddess of health, Imhotep, god of healing. Hail, Nut was the goddess of the sky. Locust, Nepur and Nepri, god and goddess of grain. Darkness, Ra, the sun god, one of the most revered. So each plague is a, is a cosmic confrontation where Yahweh systematically declares to the gods of Egypt, I am stronger than you. You cannot stop this. Isn't it encouraging? Yahweh doesn't simply say that he's bigger. He shows that he is. He doesn't simply say, I'm stronger. He shows that he is, and he demonstrates his power, so there's no confusion amongst the Egyptians. All of your gods, I have just attacked and won. But he's also making it very clear to the Hebrews. All of their gods, I've attacked and won. Where's your skepticism now? 
So try and think about it from the Hebrews perspective for a moment. Sometimes we get so caught up in the awesomeness of the story and the victory that we assume that the Hebrews would have processed these events in the same way that we do. History is written by the victors, right? So you get to sort of paint yourself in a nice picture. But I was reading one Jewish scholar this week. His name's Rav Alex Israel. And he put it this way. He said, The children of Israel have lived in Egypt for hundreds of years. Despite their horrific slavery, or maybe because of it, they lack a substantial Jewish identity. They are fully attached to an Egyptian mindset. They wear the Egyptian fashions and live in mixed neighborhoods. They worship the Egyptian gods. The Israelite people have no Jewish culture. They lack a distinct spiritual identity with a religion of their own. In this state, should God save them? To our minds, no. They have done nothing to earn it, nothing to deserve it. But that is the very grace of God in that moment. He comes. He will fulfill the covenant that he, signed, that he made with Abraham. Do you remember? There's that lantern that goes between these split animals and God makes this covenant with Abraham and he makes it almost to himself. He's faithful. His grace is extended to us. So here, Alex Israel is acknowledging that the Hebrews were likely so absorbed by the culture around them to the point of alignment with the worship of the Egyptian gods. And into this, Yahweh steps to make his claim on the people he called hundreds of years ago in Abraham. It's the grace of God at work. Coming to a people who don't know him and making himself known to them. It is a God-initiated, undeserved favor. And it's the same grace that we find in Jesus. We don't deserve it. We haven't earned it. We haven't earned God's favor. But he reaches to us in the midst of the mess. God is wonderfully consistent. Let's have a look at the Passover instructions, which we read earlier. I'm just going to go real fast here. I'm overlooking lots of details, but that's fine for now. Exodus 12. Here's, here's four, key, four sort of summary points. Get a spotless one-year-old male lamb or goat. Bring it into your house for several days before killing it at the precise time on the precise day. Take its blood and spread it on the doorposts of your houses. This will cause death to pass over your household. Roast and eat the lamb. Don't break any of its bones and burn all of its leftovers. It's a bit more than that, but that's enough. What would have... What would it have been like for the Hebrews to hear those instructions from Yahweh through Moses? Remembering that at this point, I still think there's a healthy skepticism. Healthy is the wrong word. There's skepticism. I think they're still skeptical. Because they've been so beaten down, so crushed, that they can't see hope in this moment. As I talked earlier, the Hebrews, the Hebrew slaves had a sense of cultural alignment. Alex Israel talked about that. Cultural alignment to the point of worshipping the Egyptian gods. That's a Jewish thought. They, they, they think that's where they were at. And so the instructions to kill the lamb and smear the blood on the doorposts are incredibly confronting. And it's meant to be. You see, in Egypt, the sheep was one of the sacred animals. There were numerous gods who had either ram's horns or sheep's heads. It was one of their sacred animals. And you can sort of see this if you go back where Joseph's family of shepherds come. And he's like, just don't tell them you're shepherds. Like, we'll just take that bit over there. He's a bit like, Ugh. right? Do you remember that? Maybe you don't remember that part. Go and read it. It's there. He tells them, we'll go live over there. Right? We also see this in Exodus chapter 8. Pharaoh says to Moses, you can offer your sacrifices here in the land. And Moses says, that wouldn't be right. The Egyptians detest the sacrifices we offer to the Lord our God. Look, if we offer our sacrifices here where the Egyptians can see us, they will stone us. 
So Moses knows what's at stake. Yahweh knows what's at stake. The Hebrew slaves know what's at stake. And yet the instruction is, take the lamb, kill it, put the blood on your door. Can you imagine the level of like fear in that moment for the Israelites, for the Hebrew slaves? Because they've got to process this sort of mixed religious thing that they've got going on. They've also got to do it in the midst of the people that they're sure will kill them if they do it. It's a massive showdown moment. Yahweh's forcing the point about alignment. He's provoking them with questions of where will your allegiance lie? In killing the lamb and smearing its blood on the doorposts, it was the opportunity for the Hebrews to cleanse themselves from their idolatrous views, their mixed beliefs, and to publicize the very opposite, their alignment with Yahweh. This is your moment, a fresh start. We'll cut it off. You're with me now. Let's go. And do it publicly. While I was prepping for this, it made me think about baptism. We had that last week. These young men standing up, and it, baptism is, that, is a, sort of a cut-off moment. My allegiance now lies here. The killing of the lamb was an act that the Egyptians would have expected to bring about the destruction of the Hebrews for offending their gods. But it is in fact the action that saves them from destruction. It turns it all upside down. The Passover lamb, the Passover lamb proclaims a message. I will not be an Egyptian. My destiny lies with the God of Israel. I love that. That feels strong to me. I will not be an Egyptian. My destiny, my life lies with the God of Israel, with Yahweh. The Passover is more than just a meal. It's a declaration of allegiance. It's burning all other bridges. No turning back now. For those Hebrews who participated in that, there was no tomorrow for them in Egypt. I want to, I want to suggest there was no tomorrow for them in Egypt. They would have been struck down. I think the rage of the Egyptians would have seen that done. So it's burn every bridge. You're with me now. So the declaration of Israel at Passover, that I will not be an Egyptian, is the same declaration that we make today. The Hebrews were making a defiant yet seemingly foolish choice. From the perspective of the Egyptians, foolishly bringing destruction upon themselves, yet it was the act, the very act that saved them from destruction. Paul talks about the cross this way. 1 Corinthians 1.18, the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction, but we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. To give yourself to Jesus, to say the cross is the marker, I'm cutting allegiance, I'm going, I'm going with him. That is the same foolishness of the lamb, the blood on the doorposts. My allegiance lies here. No turning back now. When we choose to embrace the foolishness of God's plan, we have to turn away from living the way the world does. It's what we see with the Hebrew slaves. They were so deep in the culture, so crushed under their slavery, I think you could argue they were no longer aware of it. Much like the world around us so entrenched in their rebellion, they can't see it anymore. And 
And so the path to freedom is presented, but it requires the Hebrews to sever all allegiances. Kill the lamb, trust the blood, walk in freedom. It's an all or nothing moment. It's an all or nothing moment. Yahweh is not happy to have a people with mixed belief, a people with one foot or one, they walk but they look back and they're longing. What he wants is people who are wholehearted for him, whose allegiance belongs to him, who are not tied back to old ways of living, not tied to their slavery because he's purchased freedom. It cost blood. And in Jesus, it cost Jesus blood. The freedom has been purchased. But how many of us walk with one hand on the chains? How many of us have got hold on to that allegiance to something back there? A slavery to sin. How many of us are like, yes, God, but I'm just going to keep this little bit with me. I'm going to actually keep, I'm going to do all the stuff, but I'm just going to kind of keep my pride still there and I'll solve problems myself. How many of us even <laughs> how many of us have got sort of a you know I don't think we do this necessarily intentionally but you know you, you carry things from that side of the cross through and out the other end like I'll, I'll just pick something silly like good luck or you know superstitions don't walk under a ladder salt over your shoulder knock on wood the guy that's harmless. Yeah, I would suggest to you gently that's you holding on to a chain. That's you holding on to a belief system that is incompatible with Yahweh, that's incompatible with Jesus. And the Passover lamb and Jesus, who in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Paul says is our Passover lamb, Your participation in the sacrifice of Jesus is a severing moment. Your allegiance is now to Him and Him only. Maybe you've got patterns of behaving, patterns of sin that you still struggle to let go of. That's a hand on the chain trying to drag it through the cross. We all do these things. It's actually part of why we do the sacred assembly every year. It's like align us, God, with you. Where I'm holding on to those things, where I've picked them back up. I dropped them last year and I took two steps this way and then I came back a bit and I picked it back up. It's like, God, I want these things out and done. My allegiance is with you. No more. No more do I hold this chain. For those who choose to trust the blood, there's freedom. Freedom from slavery. That's what the Hebrews experienced, that's what we experience. Freedom from the slave drivers, the sin that keeps us bound up and tied up. It also secures for us freedom to worship. We're made for that. Got, you know, there you go. Freedom to worship. It's what kicked off the confrontation between the Hebrews and the Egyptians in the first place. Go, we want to go to make sacrifices, worship our God. No. No. The slave drivers, the slave masters, the slavery would not permit it. Yahweh is the only one who deserves worship, but there is no one above him and he alone is worthy. But while we are slaves to sin, we will struggle in that place. 
Our slave drivers will not permit us to do the thing we were made to do. The blood of Jesus, our Passover lamb, secures for us freedom to worship. And Jesus' blood also secures for us freedom for intimate relationship with God. You see, Yahweh is unlike any other God. Almost every other ancient religion, it tended to be you stumble upon the gods. You sort of find one out in the field or you find one by the water. And then once you've found it, you have got to guess how to please it. And this is why the sacrifices got bigger and bigger and eventually you end up like sacrificing your own children because it's like I've tried everything else. This is the last thing I've got. Yahweh is not like that. He approached the people, spoke to them, called them directly, and taught them how to live as his people. There is no guesswork. You don't have to be like, oh, is that the right thing? No, it's right there. The instructions are there. Passover meal was not some accident that Moses stumbled upon, trial and error, until he found the right combination of events. It was a direct instruction from Yahweh for the sake of his people. And as they move on from Egypt, Yahweh gives them the law, the boundaries. This is what it means. This is how you can be my people and I will be your God. And one of the criticisms that's leveled at Christianity is it is a bunch of rules. I'm not allowed to do that. I'm not allowed to do that. I have to do these things and I don't understand why. And last week we had a worship team meeting and we, we were talking about living consecrated lives and we were listening to a talk by a man called James Alladarin and he put it quite profoundly and he put it this way. Boundaries are there to protect the integrity of intimacy. You cannot just look at the boundaries and say they're all about rules and regulations. Well, you're looking that way because you've not stepped into intimacy. No, not nobody, corrupted people, but I'll say nobody and then you'll understand why I said corrupted people. Nobody expects within a marriage that you would be upset with the boundaries of just the other person, right? Because it protects the integrity of intimacy. And it is the same with God. He is an intimate God and His blood purchases for us freedom for that intimate relationship. And in that space, the boundaries protect the integrity of that intimacy. It's a clever man, James Adelaide. Worship team, you guys can come up. So the Passover lamb secures freedom from slavery, freedom to worship, and freedom for intimate relationship with God. The blood of Jesus, our Passover lamb, secures freedom from slavery to sin, freedom to worship, and freedom for intimate relationship with God. And so the challenge before us every day is will I take my stand and say, I will not be an Egyptian. My destiny, my life, my future lies with Yahweh. And every time on a Sunday morning, when we take the feast of Jesus, that is the declaration we're making. I am not going to be an Egyptian. I just, look, I've got nothing against Egyptians. I've known some, they're lovely. You know what I'm getting at. I will not be an Egyptian. So what we're going to do here, we're going to take the feast of Jesus. So if you've, if you've got it there, just, just grab it. Don't, I, I suppose you could 
pre-open it and just do all the noise all at once. <coughs> I don't actually have. Oh, thank you. If you haven't got one, has everybody got, if you haven't got one, just put your hand up. We've got some people who can hand them out. So, before you, before you take this, we've got the little cracker thing, which mine's in about 14 different pieces here. The little, before we take this, I want to just invite you to ask the Holy Spirit, search me. Where am I holding on to chains? Where are the allegiances that I need to sever? Because when I take this, I want to cut it all off. When I take this bread and this juice and I participate in the cross, I'm declaring I don't want to be an Egyptian. My life is with Yahweh. Cut it all off. The pride, the silly practices, the areas of sin, the mixture that exists within my own heart. I don't want to carry those chains anymore. I want to have, because I'm the one holding them. The blood's purchased the freedom. It's me that holds on to it. I want to let that go. So just take that, just take, I don't know, just a little minute here. It could be 30 seconds. And say, Holy Spirit, search us. You who know the deepest parts of us. Bring to our minds right now the chains that we hold on to. Jesus, this morning as we take this little cracker that represents your body broken for us, and as we drink this juice that represents your blood shed for us, we remember that it cost you everything to rescue. It cost you everything to save. And it is for freedom that you set us free. So help us to walk in that. No longer an Egyptian. My allegiance belongs to you. This day, and it might be the first time that we say this, or it might be the thousandth. We say, I have decided to follow Jesus. I'm throwing myself, I'm throwing my, my lot, my family in with Jesus. So as you're ready,